boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time. Apparently with reason, this is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us today someone who grew up in apartheid South Africa. He's the son of Bishop Graham Chadwick, who was a prominent anti-apartheid activist who was arrested and exiled from South Africa. He holds master degrees from Oxford in philosophy, politics, and economics. He's been a CEO of various companies with 18 years experience and is the author of For the People, a Citizen's Manifesto to Shaping Our Nation's Future. I want to introduce to you today, Simon Chadwick. Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you very much indeed, Philip, and thank you for the invitation. First off, let me go ahead and express my admiration and respect uh, for your father, and by extension, you, because you had to live through it with him. Uh, for the, the battle, the uphill battle he had to fight in his day uh, against apartheid in South Africa. Uh, what was that like growing up in that atmosphere? Uh, it was somewhat surreal. Um, you, you had two options, really, if you were white in South Africa at the time. And I'm talking about the late 70s, early 80s. Okay. Um, you you know you could ignore what was going on around you and live a life that was very comfortable, um, nice housing, servants, you know, uh, wealth. Uh, or if you actually saw what was going on around you and understood it, um, you the sense of injustice would be very very strong. And just to give you an example, um, in the cities no blacks were allowed to live inside the cities they mm. lived outside in what were called townships they could only go into the cities if they had what was called a pass literally a passport okay to get in from where they lived into the cities and they had to be out by a certain time if they were not if they were caught you know then they would be flung in jail uh, and very often, you know, the, the the brutality of those jails would be would be um, evident. My father um, got caught up in all of this um, when uh, there was uh, there was a, a law passed by the government which said that all African children had to be taught in the language Afrikaans, which is the Dutch white language okay, yeah. of South Africa. So this was the language of the oppressor. Uh, most of them didn't speak it, so they boycotted school. And this was a huge sort of protest. And my dad and his clergy were trying to uh, persuade the kids to go back to school, which they eventually did. And the secret police, and yes, there was a secret police, right. um, thought, well, you must know who the leaders are, so arrested them all. Um, and during the time that those priests were in jail, one of them uh, died from falling out of a seventh story window while it's under interrogation. That's the sort of place it was. Right. Um, from our own personal family position, um, our house was bugged, our phones were bugged. Mm. If we wanted to have a conversation that we didn't want people to hear, we had to go right down the bottom of the yard. Um, we were followed everywhere, um, everywhere we went. There was a secret police car outside our gates 24 seven. Um, but you know, even in that, there was kind of irony. My mother was a, uh, a very, very English lady, mm -hmm. uh, who showed her defiance by taking these police people a cup of tea every morning. Right. And, you know, just very, saying, very English. I, over, yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, I know you're here, you know, you're not as secret as you think you are. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, so it was, it was violent. It was dangerous. Um, uh, and it was very, very, very oppressive. Um, but, um, you know, my dad was somebody who mixed his faith and his search for justice were indistinguishable. So this was literally a police state. Yes. Monitoring everybody's actions, thoughts, what they did, didn't do, and reacted accordingly. Exactly. Wow. Um, and I imagine, of course, it had an impact on, you know, the rest of your life and things that you've done. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I grew up with that same sense of um, a, a quest for justice. Um, I grew to have uh, a singular dictate uh, distaste for racism mm -hmm. 
um, and for uh, ill treatment of anybody who was disadvantaged. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that colored my worldview, my world approach. Uh, and I realized also that, you know, you need to keep a conversation going all the time to keep people aware of what is happening. So, for example, when my dad was uh, uh, first arrested, um, I was his press agent in London, basically. Mm -hmm. I was making sure that the British media didn't forget him. Okay. We needed to keep his name in the headlines. Um, and, you know, I think there is a tendency in this world to either ignore or um, just out of sheer fatigue, perhaps, of, of bad news, but ignore <laughs> things that are going on yeah. or, you know, or to sweep it under the rug. And you've got to keep on speaking out. Well, there's definitely a memory lag in a lot of things. Yes, <laughs> I mean, there is. It, it could be a week or two later and people have already forgotten to yeah. move on on something. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, it's hard to keep the focus on things, uh, probably because there's just a lot of things to focus on. <laughs> there's so I, much I, evil in the world to look at, I suppose. You know, you turn on any TV news channel or, you know, you go to any um, online news channel. There's so much and it's so easy to become... Uh, you know, either depressed by it or inured to it. Well, true, true. Um, so I, I read the manifesto that you had uh, for a, a democratic libertarian manifesto for 2020 on your website, uh, which I believe is uh, simonchadwick.org. Is that correct? Uh, simonchadwick.us. Dot US, I'm sorry. Yeah. All right. um, and I read through it. So, um, what makes this specifically democratic libertarian as opposed to what a lot of it looks like are platforms for the Democrat party anyway? That's a really good question. So we tend to think about politics as being on a spectrum from left to right. Yeah. You know, Democrat to Republican or however it's described in any particular country. Right. There is however, another axis, uh, which is, uh, authoritarian, Mm -hmm. to what I called libertarian and a very loose usage of the word, but sort of authoritarian to freedom, if you like. Mm -hmm. And if you cross those over, uh, you have you know, uh, four quadrants. Most of the governments in the West, the democratic governments, are up in the top right-hand corner, but it's sort of close to the center. So they're, they're sort of right-wing-ish, conservative-ish, but also tending to uh, authoritarianism, top-down rule-making, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Yes. If you go to the bottom right, that's where you get right-wing libertarianism. And that's what I call the fantasy land of the Republicans, because essentially a lot of Republicans run on that sort of basis, you know, uh, libertarian ideals, small government and all of that. But usually when they get into power, they kind of slide up into the top right. Yeah, that annoys me too, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. The, the top left is authoritarian left wing, and that's pretty much every failed communist state that you can imagine. Right. And, you know, we, we shouldn't put China in there because China has moved definitively to the right. I, I think they're more fascist than communist. They, now, they so. certainly <laughs> are. They yeah. certainly are. There is a um, there is a, a small group of countries down in the bottom left, which was what I termed democratic libertarian, which is basically to say that they have a much more uh, community minded uh, approach to life um, that is certainly is left of center in as much as you know they're concerned with with um, distribution of wealth and they do usually have higher taxes. Um, but the I, the contract with those in those countries like uh, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, New Zealand, the ne Netherlands, places like that, is that look, we will set up the, a secure a security framework. You pay your taxes, and our job is to set up a security framework and then get out of your way. And that is what I'm trying to achieve there. And I think. You know, yeah, certain things uh, in my manifesto that you uh, read certainly are on the Democratic platform. Um, but what I am not in favor of is massive regulation 
in every aspect of our lives. And I think we have, um, you know, we, there is a balance in regulation. There's, it, it, so, so let me step back just a moment, if I may, Philip, and stop me if I'm rambling. Um, but, you know, what is, what is the social contract uh, of government? It's that we pay taxes, obey reasonable laws, and due to that, government will provide us with a secure framework in which to live. And what do I mean by that? Well, I approach this looking through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, i.e., you know, what are, what are basic human needs that, that need to be present in a society for it to function? Physiological, food, housing, sleep, you know, physical safety security, financial security, economic security, educational security, social security. It's only when you get those as bedrocks that you can then go on to belong to society and actually gain esteem and actually try and be the best you can. The framework that I'm looking at is, okay, government provides that security framework in which you can build those things. It doesn't have to build them for you, but if in which you can build them in return for us being uh, involved citizens paying our taxes and obeying reasonable laws. And I think, you know, to a certain degree today, certainly in this country, we've drifted into um, a, a system in which government is involved in things in which it has no right to be involved. So for example, um, there is a huge argument, as you know, in here in North Carolina, um, on what should be taught in schools. And the legislature is trying to legislate what should be taught in schools. I don't think that it's politicians' business to tell us what should be taught in schools. I think that's the teachers' business. I think it's society's business, but it's, it's certainly not some guy out of you know warrington or raleigh or charlotte who's elected into the legislature it, he does not have that expertise or she does not have that expertise and has no right to be saying what that should be so the form of the form of government that i'm looking at is your job government is to provide that framework of security our job is to live as citizens uh and in a a way that is uh conducive to a peaceful society well i would say off the top of my head the american constitution was made with that concept in mind to provide a framework and then to get out of the way uh, i mean they, the, right. the way it was written was specific to we'll let we will let the federal government do these things and then go away but that has drastically increased since then right um so i, I mean do we just have to remember that? Are we I not teaching it in school, for example? I mean, there's when you talk about school, for example, who does get to decide? I mean, well, I agree with you. I don't think the government should take your money and then tell you we're going to teach your kid these things. Right. Right. So and who think, gets to decide? I think who gets to decide. I mean, we have various, you know, various different stakeholders here, don't we? Mm -hmm. We have the kids themselves, we have kids' parents, we have uh, academics, you know, teachers, and then we have academics um, who inform those those teachers. Um, we have uh, business. Yeah, business is it, we we are competing in a global economy. Right. Business is going to need educated kids. Yeah, the one of the the, the basis for this, Philip, is that this writing this book was that America is the richest country in the world, and it's failing on so many security aspects. And one of those is education. Mm -hmm. in, in terms of high school results, we are number 34 in the world in terms of math. We are number 23 in terms of reading. How the hell does the richest nation in the world fail so spectacularly in terms of educational attainment? I imagine because money is not everything to it. Well, or you could look at it and say, well, how is it actually funded? How is it funded and how is it taught? 
Yeah. <laughs> what what is important as taught? This is so this is yeah. an argument that's beyond we need education. We know that. But it's a matter of what are you teaching? What standards are you holding? Are you going to enforce the standards? Which means some kids won't make it. Some kids won't make it. And are you uh actually do are you actually um applying those standards and the funding equitably? Yes. One of the problems we have in this country, and it's totally understandable, is the way in which we fund education. It's primarily out of property tax. That made a heck of a lot of sense with the schoolhouse on the prairie, because you know that was that that region's school, and they had to pay the the school teacher. It does not make sense in urban America, where you've got such disparate uh, property values. You know, going from one part of a city to another, it just does not make sense. So, in that sense, part of this is due to us actually hanging on to old ways of doing things when we could have thought of perhaps we put, could have actually looked around the world and said, "Well, how do other people do it?" And that's something we don't tend to do very much. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's that was the, the reasoning. I, you, you could look at healthcare, you could look at um, you know, jobs performance or uh, or equity. All of those things we are underperforming on, and that's not to to go against one party or the other. What it is to say is we've forgotten what the social contract with government is, and you're quite right to say that the constitution was written in that way. And part of what I say in the book is that if we want to return to the constitution and we want to return to the Declaration of Independence, then we have to think differently. And I'll just leave you with one final thought on that. Liberty, liberty is a word we hear a lot about. Uh, freedom, we hear that word a lot. But go to the roots of that word. Liberty comes from Latin libertas. One of the translations of libertas is freedom from fear. There is a lot of fear in this country because there is a lot of insecurity in this country. We are not holding up our end of the bargain as a society. And that's what I want to change. The idea then of having, I guess, the libertarian aspect of the name, less government involvement, Yet when I look at some of the manifesto, it more than compensates with government in, uh, involvement in a lot of things. It's like you went from, well, don't get involved in this, but yeah, let's totally run this, which then creates a very intrusive entity into a whole lot of related things. Some things so, you have listed are like reversible climate change, right? Provide the best healthcare system in the world, right? Provide effect, uh, affordable housing in every city. I provide a living minimum wage, which is subjective, right? Legalize drugs and monitor it with yet another government entity to do it, right? You, we're, you're still creating this. You just shift the power to somewhere else, which will then use it as a pretext to grab more power. So let's take some of those, all right? Because each and every one of those, what I show in the book itself, and you've read just the manifesto, which is a sort of summary at the back. Yes, sir. But in, in each and every one of those, what I seek to show is that uh, by doing some of those things, you actually create not only more freedom, but you actually are far more efficient as a society. You spend far less. So let's take one aspect of that, legalization of drugs. OK, now the right now we have since was it Nixon who came up with this thought, the war on drugs? I'm not sure. Where we, from, honestly. I think it, I think it was Nixon. But, you know, let's let's say it was him. Sure. Uh, yeah. Cause, and then there was Nancy Reagan saying, just say no. They know, right, um, yeah. yeah. But basically we have spent trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars fighting that war, so-called war. And it has got us precisely nowhere. Now, if you think about it, there are a number of things that can and, and possibly should be done 
in order to say, okay, well, let's try and get rid of the demand or at least temper that demand. And let us get rid of the, the, the incentive to crime that exists in the drug market. If you legalize pretty much, you know, all substances, but at the same time provide the, the uh, infrastructure for, to be able to enable people to actually get off those drugs, i.e. antidotes and so on, you not only take out the criminal element and the war element and the spending on that, you very likely, as in some countries we've seen, see the rate of drug use go down. But there is one other thing, and this Portugal found this when they uh, uh, legalized drugs. The amount of things like needle sharing uh, and uh, un unsafe habits dropped and the AIDS uh, pandemic that was hitting Portugal at that time disappeared. So you can look at things that basically what this is saying is, look, you can set up a, a framework of security by saying, okay, get government out of that, redirect that those funds to how do we mitigate and, and basically allow for it to die. And then we've got uh, results that occur that are actually far more efficient, far more effective, and we're not wasting our money. And we don't have God knows how many police wandering around the place trying to take down drug dealers. I honestly believe we don't have many doing it, in my opinion. <laughs> we're just, we're, I think I think we've thrown up our hands and we're not fighting it and pretending we are. That's my honest opinion. It's, well, you may it's, be right. I mean, in that regard... I'm open to a lot of we need to change how we deal with drugs, period, because we're just not doing it anyway. Um, yeah. And, and I, I just have a problem with financing someone else's drug habit. I mean, that's kind of my thing. Why do I want to finance your drug habit? So think about it this way. Um, you know, if if by financing the if, if by enabling through your taxes, the uh, destruction of the criminal market in drugs and the ability to actually fight those drugs through um, uh, sort of centers that can deal with drug addicts and actually wean them off and you're you're seeing less crime on the streets less gang activity all of that which which actually happens yeah. the return on investment on your taxes is far far greater than what you're getting right now okay they, so you're you mean to tell me the government will gladly downscale that budget and put it somewhere else because they don't need it no more <laughs> i am not going to pretend that government <laughs> is in any way <laughs> as logical as that right, no, exactly <laughs> <laughs> exactly uh I, I don't know. I just, uh, that, that's one that I'm going to need some serious selling on that particular topic itself. Mm -hmm. Um, but like the, the climate change thing, right? Mm -hmm. First off, I'm not sold as a, apocalyptic as it's made out to be. Does that mean there's not any pollution? No. <laughs> right. But that we have to basically turn over the keys of all control to basically economy to solve this problem that what do we have left now according to aoc nine years three years eight years left before we die or eight something nine. all right so not uh, before we die you know, but before, when, yeah. when i when i get to year 10 i'm going to give her a call say so what's up <laughs> right but but that's being used as a well the crisis pretext to seize power to gain control of apparatuses of society why would i want to be on board with that well uh, one thing I would just say to you, Philip, is um, do you really want to take the gamble that you are right about it? You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. The gamble uh, is based upon educated guesses about percentages. Yeah, chances. but I, I'm still saying it's a gamble. It's always a gamble. Yeah. Do do I want to take the gamble of I'll let you take control of everything to save me from something I'm not even convinced is a problem and let you yes. run my life and my liberties? Do you want to take that gamble? 
It's an equal now, question in reverse. What's that, what life and liberty is being taken away from you? In that? If they control economies in order to save trees, that affects free enterprise. That affects what you choose to do economically. It affects how people earn money. It, it, it affects a lot. It put, I've just, just today, I've read socialist forums where they talk about this new Green Deal as an opportunity to fight capitalism and take control of the economy and to use it as leverage. That this is a real threat. Okay. So in my view, which is diametrically opposed to your view, Absolutely. Um, the, the science is pretty compelling, pretty convincing. I have read it and I believe that it is real. We are indeed seeing a, um, a, an acceleration of warming that has not happened on this planet before. Um, and the consequences of that for, let's just take coastal regions or let's just take the droughts that are going to occur in various parts of the world or in this country. Um, we're already seeing some of those phenomena occur. There is a tremendous opportunity to actually uh, rethink the energy market, the energy production uh, market, and actually take control for America of our ability to, uh, to, to do that. We don't need oil coming in from other places. We don't need to be burning carbon fuel. And I know you're from West Virginia and that probably has some, uh, you know, some, some controversy attached to my thinking there. But if that is the case and we can uh, reverse these trends to the point that we are not going to see rising seas engulf Miami or droughts wipe out uh, the Midwest again, um, then I think it is well worth doing. I do not see it as a power grab. If there are people on the left who are talking that stuff, stuff they are as idiotic as the people on the right who talk about, um, you know, the, the, the fact that their liberties are being trodden on when they're asked to wear a mask. Um, the, the, all of this, it's, we, we have to actually have a conversation in the middle about this because, you know, the consequences of, you're being wrong could be existential. The same otherwise. The the consequences of you being wrong is just as grave and more realistic, in my opinion. We have to agree to disagree. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, definitely disagree. But uh, the other thing, housing, affordable housing in every city. Now, how is that going to be accomplished realistically? Well, uh, in the book, I actually um, use Raleigh as a, an example of, you know, how they're trying to deal with that. Um, and it is a very much in a public-private partnership. Uh, that is that the, um, the developers are being incentivized to build, you know, when they're building, um, say, in one part of the city, um, it, you know, massive tower blocks or whatever for, for uh, upscale residential uh, stuff, that they also commit to building affordable housing, uh, either in that area or in another area. This has actually worked really well. I mean, Raleigh's still struggling with it um, because essentially we're getting 100,000 people a year. <laughs> More than houses <laughs> exist. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, what it has done is um, it has reduced the, the, the degree of homelessness. Homelessness in itself ha has a cost to society. And there is a number of reasons for that. Um, but it also, what, it, what has been shown time and time again now, is once you get people into low-cost housing, people who would otherwise be homeless, they then have the ability much, much more to, um, to actually get, A, get a job, B, you know, start being productive, and that helps everybody. It helps the economy. It puts taxes into the into now, uh, will this property be privately owned or is this like they're renting it or is it through hud what's the setup with that um it is in in raleigh it is uh it is owned by the developers um and they are and i, I want to say that 
I think they get incentivized through um, through through the local government, but I don't think the local government actually owns that housing. It's not government housing as, okay. for example, exists existed in Britain or in uh, Europe. So they're given yeah. incentives to to provide this. That's right. And but is it uh, is the private property owned by the developers or by the the people living there? It's uh, ultimately owned by the people living there. So they they buy these homes. Yeah. Okay. All right, well. I, I like that. <laughs> and and it's a it's a non socialistic approach to right. trying to, to solve a problem. Right. Cause because the minute if I would have heard that, you know, the government was running it and doling it out, I would have immediately expected the worst uh, of an outcome for it. But this one appeals to their work ethic to climb to get a chance. I like that. Yeah. There's an incentive to the property owners to not take a loss just for giving it up. And and it meets the housing need uh, yeah. that Raleigh's facing right now. That, so do, that's are, exactly right. Are you aware of uh, this program being tried in other cities around the country? Uh, yeah, it's being tried in a whole bunch of cities. Um, I believe that Charlotte is looking at the same thing. Durham definitely has in in North Carolina. It's it's doing it. Um, I believe Richmond in Virginia uh, is also uh, pursuing this. So. And just in in the Mid Atlantic, you know, a lot of cities are are, are taking this approach. Okay. Uh, now, regarding other things that you've listed on uh, your manifesto there, and and I imagine you just des- you describe it to greater length in your book. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you mentioned things like, uh, well, you talked about liberty in, in our concepts of liberty, and I just want to throw a few things at you that to me are a concern towards liberty uh, from, mm. and maybe you can better explain it to me than I have received it. Uh, but uh, the first one being uh, to reinforce separation of church and state uh, that laws that are based in religious mores will not be considered. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah. So um, yeah, there was a, a very, very good reason for, uh, the separation of church and state in the beginning of the, this nation's life, um, which was that so many people who were coming here were coming here to flee pers- you know, religious persecution. Um, and that, you know, that religious persecution was usually uh, instigated by a uh, some form of state church. So in the UK, mm-hmm. by the Church of England, um, right. so on. Um, and I think you know, it was uh, it was a brilliant solution to say the two things are separate. They have their influences on society and on people, but let's get, keep them uh, out of each other's area. And the, the, the state cannot impose a religion, but at the same time, religion cannot uh, impose its own mores on the state. Now, by mores, for example... To, to use your father's example, mm-hmm. a religious more of not to exercise racism due to a Christian faith under that pretext here. Can that be shot down as well? Those are your religious mores. We won't consider that as a part of re- legislation. That's a, a good question. Uh, I think there is a line that is drawn when the state actually oversteps its own bounds mm-hmm. um, and is pursuing uh, th- things that are absolutely morally wrong but based on what morality um, is my question <laughs> well based on on basic human morality i think based is, upon uh, what so i mean because if, if moors are different my understanding of this is moors can be different in certain societies different religions yeah. and if we, we're assuming there's a universal human one which may not be the case in some places yeah that may not it, well i i i tend to believe that there is but that's that's Going to go to, over to the philosophy side of, uh, <laughs> of, of my. I, I my don't hate philosophy, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, but the, the, the so to give you an example, um, I I believe right now that uh, there you know there is a tremendous uh, push um, to reverse abortion laws. And that this is being pushed uh, in in many aspects by um, various Christian bodies, um, which you know I totally respect their view on abortion being wrong. I do not respect 
their right to force that view on everybody else. Now, neither do I respect the right of government actually to say, of the federal government or a state government, to say, uh, we are going to rule on this and we're going to provide it as a right or not provide it as a right. So one of the things in the book that I talk about, which may surprise you, is that that is probably the type of decision that should be taken at a community level. Maybe it could be taken at a county level, or I don't know, but reduce it down to the smallest area such that if you have a you know a group of people living in one area who go, we don't want that to provide that here, then fine, that's okay. But that means that you're not imposing that view on 360 Amer million Americans uh, across the country. So it's not so a moral view if someone views it as murder? Well, I mean, because if I view murder in any other form, for example, and for me to voice that in legislation, it wouldn't get shot down, I hope, <laughs> as a moral more. We can't consider that in this legislation. And that's why we the, extend it to abortion, which to many Christians, that's what it is. Are, are they Christians. not to try to alleviate that, what they see as a huge injustice in the land? I think they are, yeah, the, there is the argument. That, that is the, the, the nub of the argument, isn't it? Right. It, because essentially to Christians, yes, it is murder. And to some Christians, it isn't. Many Christians, it is. To many who are not Christian, and I'm not talking about other religions, but just, you know, not involved, it isn't. And there is even this, you know, an argument in the medical world and in the philosophical world as to whether it is or when it becomes that. Right, right. And I think that's the problem here that, you know, we, we cannot just say this side is right. Sorry. You know, we've got to actually either reduce the decision making power down to people who are immediately impacted by it, or we've got to have a conversation that goes on in society about, well, how do we, how do we actually deal with this? So I'll tell you, I'll give you an example. Um, the abortion was made legal in the UK in 1967. Mm. The way in which that occurred was that a bill came before, before parliament and in parliament, um, this, your listeners will be amused at this, but parliament in the UK, although it's called the mother of parliament, you know, it's not exactly the most democratic thing that there is. Right. Uh, because we, you know, there, there's a lot of party based voting and they have whips and, you know, you damn well will vote the way we right. tell you. Right. And that's what most, how most laws are passed there. In the case of this one, every single MP was allowed to vote their conscience, i.e., we're not going to tell you how to vote. You vote the way in which you feel is right. Mm -hmm. And that's how that decision came about. They revisit that decision every five years, and they have a vote of conscience every five years. And they have they've they've tinkered with the, the law. You know, they've reduced the number of weeks and all of that. In a question such as this, I would prefer that people have the liberty and the freedom to actually do a conscience vote than have one section of society who has a view and a view that they have every right to dictate that that is the way society is going to go. Well, I can understand what you're saying, but then uh, I put it into, say, historical context of slavery. And the solution to slavery at the time was a regional thing. You all locally figure out how you want to handle it. Don't impose that view on somebody else. Is slavery right or wrong? Now, is that you're, I, you, you make a really good point there. You make a really good point. And I think, you know, the it, it is interesting if you go back to the history of that time, um, before the Civil War, uh, you know, there was this balance in Congress, right, and particularly in the Senate. And you know, for, for a long time, or for at least for some time, there was this desire to keep that balance between slave owning states and non slave owning states, right. allowing this 
this this locality of decision making, if you like, to exist. It only broke apart when the country started expanding to the right. West. Mm -hmm. And you know, that that whole thing about, well, is it a slave state, is it not a slave state? Right. Came to the fore. And it was then that um, you know, Lincoln was coming into power saying, It's you know, I'm I'm against slavery, and then the South you know, started to secede. Right. Um, and you know, at that point it, it became a political uh, a political fight and, and ultimately a war. The key, I guess, is um, you know, do we, here we were dealing with fully formed human beings, which you may say that, you know, a, a, a fetus at one day is, and that, you know, that's the debate that's going on. But here at least we had fully formed live human beings being subjected to slavery. Now, I'm sure there were a lot of people in South Africa, the Dutch white population justified what they were doing right. by going back into the Bible and saying that blacks were the descendants of Ham. Right. Um, and they thought this was a justification. Many people in the South, uh, at that time, justified their thinking by saying that, you know, hey, St. Paul actually mentioned slaves. You know, there's, there is mention of slavery throughout the Bible, yeah. some of it approving. I think we have to, we have to try as we can, and we're all sort of, how did you describe yourself in your um, uh, in your biography? I'm nobody amongst a lot of nobodies. <laughs> um, Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we are all in this. Yeah. So sm we're all small cogs in this, and we've got to try and work these philosoph philosophically difficult questions out. But you know, in that sense, time had moved on. Slavery was felt to be by many nations across the world wrong and had been bad. At this point. America started, you know, fought to decide that question. I'm not saying that that is not going to be the case. I don't want a war over abortion, right. but I'm yeah. not saying <laughs> it's going not. to be the case. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that the uh, argument is more tending towards your point of view, that more people are actually beginning to, to think that um, the number of abortions is reducing uh, over time in the country, not just because of lack of availability, but also because there is a change in people's thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the better way that we actually fight it rather than mandating it. I, I agree with you that if you can make everybody behave the way they should, things would be easier. <laughs> <laughs> but well, the uh, way you think they yeah, should. <laughs> exactly. Right. So if we all just thought exactly the same and did, it'd be great. But uh, alas, it's not. But uh, I, I guess yeah. I'm just trying to highlight some of my fears with the idea of if it's if it can be considered religious, then you're not allowed to consider any legislation regarding it because most of the abolitionist movements, if not all of them in the day, were led by very hey. Christian people. To them, it was a Christian motive to free the slaves and they wanted it gone it was a scourge upon the land they wanted it removed for religious reasons if we we're to use i fear your paradigm things like that can't be considered if someone can just go like you said the afrikaners anybody can take the bible flip to a verse go oh this is religious you can't admit that as legislation you've put into the hands of people an ability to suppress what a nation needs to maybe discuss I I hear you, and um, those sorts of discussions do need to to take place. What I am against um, is the use of uh, government by minorities to impose their views on everybody through legislation. I fear, I, I I don't think there is anything wrong in those who have certain views, arguing those views and trying to get the majority to go along with them and legislate on that basis. Yes. 
but I do not agree that, you know, a bunch of people who are in the minority can manipulate their views into law. Well, I would definitely agree with you. Um, and, and I would just say, just as I read your manifesto, that's the thing that sticks out to me. And that's screaming danger, danger, <laughs> danger, you know, <laughs> the suppression of voice. If they could somehow just to tie it to your religious faith, then you are immediately discredited from the legislative process. To me, that's a danger. Uh, I, it's just one of those things that sticks out to me is, you know, you talked about liberty. It's a, I don't want to be in fear that because I'm considered a Christian, I no longer get a voice in government. Right. You certainly, I and mean, you, you will see this in, in the book itself, in the main okay. in the main part of the book. Right. I'm not saying you don't get a voice in government. I think I'm saying you definitely have a voice in government because you're part of society. Right. What I'm saying is I do not want you then to manipulate, um, right. you know, the, 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 the levers of power to achieve something that, you know, um, the majority hasn't agreed to. Well, I, I definitely am against levers of power. <laughs> uh, yeah. The manipulation and, and, of power and, absolutely infuriates me. Uh, yeah. It, it, you're right about that. Uh, and, and that's what's caused, I think, a lot of problems through the, through the years that I've been alive here in this country is someone takes this little trick of the mechanism and forces yes. something through that would have never passed legislation. And, and now we have to deal with it. And yes. it's like, <laughs> and, and it, it, that's frustrating. Absolutely yeah, frustrating. Very uh, frustrating. Well, Simon, uh, we're about at the end of our interview. I could probably go on a couple more hours. <laughs> so could I. Yeah, sure. so could I. I have not had such a decent conversation with a conservative in a long time. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been quite charming yourself. <laughs> But uh, perhaps another time we'll have to have you back to to maybe uh, look at some of these other things that you have. Uh, and by the way, there's some things you've listed that I was absolutely for. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I, I think we can streamline our defense. I'm in favor, honestly, of shrinking our defense force to make it more efficient because it's bloated and it's yeah. full of appointees and politics. And because I believe we could massively expand it if the army is trained in a way to do it. Uh, and have willing volunteers for the crisis rather than just flinging out whoever we bribed to serve <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'm, and I think it would honestly make us stronger and make us more appealing on an international basis. Uh, uh, and, and I'm trying to think of some other things you've mentioned. Um, you know, of course, I'm for the libertarian side of the things you listed for government. <laughs> uh, not some, yeah. when I, I fear an oversight of the federal government does it, they just, they get an opening and they move in and they don't leave. They just grow and you don't get no service from them. The part of the social contract you're talking about, <laughs> yeah. what we pay into, we don't get back. I still, we still don't get our rose paid. I mean, it's, it's horrible. If we can't I, do that, how are they going to run healthcare? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> I insane. mean, I, I I agree with you. And, and then we haven't even talked about money and politics and all of that sort of stuff, which, you know, we could go on about for, for ages. But I'm, I'm glad that there are things that you do agree with. As I said uh, before we came on, you know, I wrote the book to start a conversation. The best review that I could never publish on the back of the book because of the language it used came from a, a, an <laughs> an evangelical conservative in Dallas who said, you know, you may not agree with everything he's written, but you can't piss all over it. <laughs> okay, Dan. <laughs> Great review, I suppose. <laughs> I probably would have worded it differently. But <laughs> I think he probably would have done. Nonetheless, uh, Simon, it's been awesome talking to you. Thank you very much, Philip. It's been a real delight. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Welcome to the essay segment. Uh, once again, I want to extend my thanks to Simon Chadwick for being with us today. Um, though he has uh, varying ideas that are at odds with mine and maybe perhaps some of you listening, uh, it was still good to have a conversation and to debate the fine points uh, by no means did we get to the bottom of anything uh, per se. Uh, still a lot more we could have pursued. Um, but alas, there's, you know, time limits on what people can discuss. There's a, a whole bunch of content. And and in a way, 
That is the difficulty of having good debates. If you have multiple topics to attend to, what tends to happen is, is if you feel you're not you're losing out on one part of a debate, you can switch subjects and you bounce around. And well, if I'm not strong here, I'll be strong here. Or and you never really get to the bottom of a conclusion on a particular topic. Uh, that is probably one of my regrets uh, in this episode. But uh, again, I don't know. It's a trade-off. I wanted to cover a bunch of things, and a lot of it we still haven't covered. Um, but one thing I really want to look at in particular um, is in regard to the idea that had been presented that, uh, for example, health care, uh, universal health care being uh, – and, and this is – part. Uh, that is one example of the whole idea behind this uh, notion of uh, democratic libertarianism, which if you remember from the interview, you had um, Simon explain, you have the left and right, as maybe some of you understand it, but then you correspond that with authoritarian versus more libertarian principles. And uh, so you have you know these four squares, uh, you know the top left, you have the authoritarian left and in the bottom left you have the libertarian left the top right the authoritarian right the bottom right the libertarian right um he's uh saying that he's advocating things for the from the libertarian left perspective and this is how he's breaking it down of course um one of the the main drives it seems to me of that position is is uh, to basically provide this big safety net and that society provide it and that this should be something that is provided and it's considered, as he worded it, an investment. Uh, now, of course, many of us perhaps have a different idea of what a safety net is. Uh, to me, I picture safety net as in, you know, like the old circus days. You have a tightrope walker or somebody on the... Uh, um, swinging on those bars or whatnot, uh, jumping back and forth. And, and below them, you have these nets that are set up so that if they fall, the net catches them, they don't go splat, and, you know, they're gone, right? Um, and so that, that term safety net is kind of, you know, what that means. It's meant to catch you if you fall. And that's the obsession to provide an entire nation of nets to where if something falls, it catches it. Um, and I'm not really against safety nets, per se. I, and honestly, I don't think most Americans are. We, we have an understanding for a need of catching somebody when they fall, but there's a difference in how we view the safety net, oftentimes from the left versus the right, regardless of authoritarian version or not. This is how it's viewed. Those on the right are like this. You fall into the net, we caught you, now get back out of the net and get back into the game. That's how we view the safety net. The left tends to see the safety net as something that catches you, but it's profitable and it's a benefit to the political parlance, so they like to keep that net kind of full of people. In other words, they got you in a dragnet to tie you to their political system, to tie you to their ideology. Uh, it's a dependence-based mentality to where you, whether you need the government or not, you want them because they got you in this net. And, and to, con to continue the illustration with the, the safety net catching somebody, so it's like the tightrope walker falls, gets caught in the net, and rather than, whew, I'm glad I got caught. I need, you know, let me get back out of here and get back at my job. No, instead they land in the net and they, they sit there a moment and they're like, oh, this is kind of nice. You know, it's like a hammock now. So they, they kind of hang out in it. But then they call out to all the other people around them. Hey, I'm sitting in this net. Can you bring me something to eat? You know what? I'm thirsty. Uh, and then it escalates. Hey, I need Wi-Fi here. And you know what? I need a television. And you know, I need you all to basically start meeting my basic needs because I don't want to get out of this net. Well, it, it turns from being a safety net to somebody's new home, somebody's new way of life, right? Others see it and catch on. I want to be in that net too. 
So you, people get caught in these nets and they don't leave them. They stay in them. There's no real incentive to get them to get out of the nets. They stay in them. Why? Because the left profits by these people staying in the net and they use this idea of fear and insecurity to keep them there. It's a source of political power, really, is what it is. Uh, some of the things that Simon had mentioned, uh, and, and you can go back and listen to this again and catch it. He was talking about this idea of liberty being the basis of um, not having fear or insecurity. Being secure and not having fear that that's what liberty is. That That's sort of, when he's talking about liberty, that's what he means, which is a very bad <laughs> illustration of what liberty is. Uh, offering you security and trying to say, I'll take away your fears, that, that is like the, every authoritarian's uh, playbook, whether left or right. I find a hard time buying that as the definition of liberty. It really is. Look, you can, you can be secure and even have a good element of not being in fear and yet still not have true liberty. You can still have freedoms not existing, and yet you're secure. You know, you you have uh, you know your relative peace, but you don't feel free. And, and that's a bad definition to describe liberty about. Now, I wanted to kind of go on that a little bit more, uh, but man, I uh, in, in testing these essays, they they've gone on a long time, so I'm trying to condense it here. Uh, but I, I want to basically just target an aspect of this net, the safety net, right? One of the examples, and he brought it up, is Denmark, for example, as to, look, they did it, we can do it. They have the most perfect, best healthcare system in the world, and if only we have the courage to do the same thing, we could have it too. That's sort of the selling point of the, if I may, the uh, democratic libertarian position, right? The whole left actually loves this idea, mainly because it's a government-controlled thing. They love government control. They can't get enough of it. So what I want to do for the rest of this essay segment is basically cover this whole thing of Denmark, right? Looking at uh, what Denmark is and then look at this healthcare thing that's provided that is like so lauded by so many in this nation and, and, and just take an honest perspective of it. All right, and there's some of the things I'm going to bring up. I'm not saying we should be for or against it or adopt it or not. I'm just bringing it to your attention, and you can decide what you think about it. Because I mean, to me, this should just speak for itself. It's something that's called uh, self-evident, right? And you can decide if this is something you really want or not, right? I, I think most Americans wouldn't want this if you really thought about what's being asked of you in order to receive it. But let's go ahead and look at two aspects, which I think are the two biggest things Americans should consider regarding a system of health care. And it's not just health care. Health care and all these other welfare uh, apparatuses that are maintained at such a high level. Uh, I use the health care as one example of this because it is one of the biggest things they pay for in that country. But first, let's look at Denmark itself as far as financial considerations are concerned. In order to maintain a system like this, their taxes are about double what yours are. All right, their, their taxes to their GP or uh, their taxes to their gross domestic product by ratio, all right, is at a forty-six point three. The United States is at a twenty-four point five. Okay, they they practically double us in that rate in the level of taxation. Okay, now. That's only part of it. And this is something that, uh, that is agreed upon. Yes, it costs more, but again, what is it presented as? An investment. Now, I don't know about you, and perhaps maybe those who call this thing an investment, maybe they don't think about the monetary idea of that, but uh, an investment is when I put something into it, I want something back. And I don't want trinkets. I want an actual good return on my investment. That's called a good investment. But to call this thing an investment is an absolute joke. It's a loser's investment, and you don't get what you pay for, period. You simply do not. 
The first part of it is, is, well, your taxes are going to be really high. But here's the other half of it. The cost of living will be high because things are taxed more. And over there, they have a thing called the VAT tax. Most of Europe has this, where, where they tax things from the very beginning all the way through to the end. And a lot of their, like, so a lot of our imports cost more over there with a VAT tax, right? A lot of goods and services over there, they, they cost more because they tax everything moving. Whereas things here are relatively cheap. Our country does not have such a tax. I don't think we should ever have such a tax. And it gives us an advantage economically over many of these other nations, especially Denmark. Now, to give you an example of why this is a uh, prime consideration, look, in Denmark versus us, the United States, we, at local purchasing power, individual local purchasing power, we have 39% more purchasing power than those who live in Denmark. In other words, you get more for your dollar than they get, and you're tax less. Your standard of living is going to be pretty good. You have what's called a margin. You have options with your money more than they have with theirs. An example, a pair of jeans over there on average is like $130. Jeans, blue jeans, $130, right? You can go to most stores here in the States and still find new jeans, like 20 bucks, 30 bucks maybe. You know, a lot of times you can go to uh, secondhand stores and still get them brand new and pay even less. <laughs> You're going to pay $130 in Denmark for your pair of jeans, right? Let's look at cars. Price of cars over there are about doubled. So whatever you pay for your car, brand new. So, you know, 20000 30000 now, maybe some are going up to 40000 due to our inflation, due to a bad fiscal policy of our government. Double that. And then buy the gasoline that you got to fill in <laughs> to that vehicle, which over there is sold by the leader, and it costs a whole lot more than what you pay for a gallon. That's the kind of standard of living you have in these systems. Things just grow in price. You have less money take home from your taxes, and now what you have left to spend, you can buy less with what you got. Is that really what you want? Now, I know one of the main selling points for this whole we can have free health care is this idea that the rich are going to pay for it. But I want to bring to your attention that in Denmark, they have lower taxes on their corporations than we do in the United States. Did you hear that? Their taxes are about double yours, close to half of their income. And yet, they tax the corporations there less than us. <laughs> Don't ever fall for that lie that the rich are going to pay for anything. It gets spread out to the middle class. That's who suffers from it. That's who has to bear the cost. They have lawyers and find little tricks and ways, and, and they're just in tune with the politicians more by nature of their money. They're not going to pay a lion's share. We do. The average American citizen would have to share this burden, and by share meaning it's coming out of your pocket, and you're going to pay quite a bit to get a service that, well, honestly, you probably not might might not even like in the long run. Now, of course, one of the things that are how, uh, highlighted about Denmark is, well, uh, you know, they, they have cheaper rent there, right? The housing is better, uh, supposedly. I mean, this is presented in a broad stroke brush, but uh, it, it's not that simple. Because first off, that's being compared to housing in New York City. New York City. Now, I would dare say that the overwhelming number of places in the United States has cheaper rent than New York City. Of course, they probably have lesser rent than what's in New York City. No one can afford to live in New York City unless you're rich or the government's paying for it. That's about it. Uh, that's compared to New York City, though. But there's another reason why housing is kind of down as opposed to here in the United States. And this is the idea of their system. This is something that maybe you didn't understand Denmark was like. It is extremely difficult for a foreigner to buy property in 
Denmark. You have to live there five years, yeah, and you have to have five years valid reason. Like you had to have like these special permits to be there and work and whatever. So it's not like you just happen to plop yourself there five years. You, you have to be a validated five-year resident with a reason. And still, after those five years, there's only certain places you can buy and you have to get permission from the Department of Civil Affairs over in Denmark before you can even buy as a foreigner there. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's harsh, but what does it have to do with the scheme of things? Well, look. You have less people buying. See, we are open. It's very easy for foreigners to buy property here in the United States. They can buy it as an investment, resell it, rent it out, do whatever they want with it. Property here changes hands a lot more, which increases the price of it, which makes it higher. But we can sell our property probably easier here than we can in Denmark because they have a lot of restrictions on who can buy. And, and a lot of people don't want to buy because there's a lot of tax and maintenance required to own a place. Only the wealthy get to have housing over there. I don't like that idea. I like that the middle class and even those aspiring to climb into the middle class can actually own their own home. That's not much of a reality there in Denmark. Well, maybe that's what you want. I don't know. Cigarettes are cheaper in Denmark. So, hey, if, you know, if you're still hanging, if you're still one of those people that think smoking is great and you haven't looked at what it does to you yet, and you're like, and you're mad that cigarettes are higher. Oh, by the way, government taxed them. That's why they're high. They're making more on it than the companies do selling it. So bear that in mind. Government is hungry for money. Give them an excuse to take more. Go ahead. But hey, at least in Denmark, for some reason, it's cheaper to get cigarettes there. So maybe if that's your dream, we should adopt and you know, become just like Denmark. But let's look at the healthcare system. Taking those things into account, though, maybe you're thinking, again, because it's sold as it's an investment. It's a poor return on investment. And, and here's, a, here's a strange reality. Before I go down this health care, let me throw this out there for you real quick, okay? Ratio-wise, according to our gross domestic products, the ratio we spend on medical care versus Denmark Okay, and our gross domestic product is obviously higher than theirs. So by comparison, we spend a lot more on our healthcare system than Denmark does. Did you hear what I just said? We spend more already, and we don't tax you nearly as much. They have to tax people to the max in order to support this system, among other systems, in order to maintain them. But what are you getting then for this excessive tax apparatus to support this system, right? I mean, you, you take a course into consideration the taxes and the cost of living, which are going to be worse for you. But looks at, let's look at this quote-unquote free health care, because it's not free, because you're going to pay for it. The rich aren't going to pay for it. You are, and you're going to pay a lot for it. But let's look at, again, I'm just looking at Den, Denmark's uh, health care. Out of pocket, you still got to pay for physical therapy, for a dentist, for a psychologist, for your prescriptions. All this is out of pocket. Did you know that? That's not free. Shocking, I know. And look, there are some services that they provide for you that doctors don't provide. One of the prime examples is childbirth. They use midwives, which, you know what, I'm okay with with a midwife, you know, it, it doesn't hurt my sensibilities. Uh, but here's the thing, that's the system there. And the reason is, is because they can pay a midwife one fifth of the cost that they could a doctor with that child. Now, for some of us, you know, in a realm of choice, maybe you're okay with that. But you know what, I'm convinced a lot of you Americans, you're used to a certain idea. You're about to give birth you want your child born in a hospital, and you want an actual doctor there. Well, in this healthcare system of Denmark, lauded for all of its greatness, you get a midwife. If you want a doctor, you're going to pay for it. Maybe you didn't know that. In fact, in Denmark, you still have private insurance to cover things because they don't cover everything. They still... Despite the fact they take all that money from you and you have a higher cost of living, you still probably have to get private insurance to cover other things. This is insane. Not to mention you're going to have the, 
wait times. And this is one of the biggest issues in countries like Denmark that have these universal health care systems. One of the biggest things, the problems they have, and for some reason, I don't know why, it's just absolutely ignored in consideration by the left, is the wait times are absolutely horrendous. It's a big issue. You, you wait months to get treatment. Now, They've tried to kind of mitigate this a little bit in Denmark because they have a group one and a group two insurance. Like 98% of the country is still on group one. That's where everything's paid for. But you have to wait on their appointments. You have to see who they say you have to see. You have to get referrals. It's like the HMO that nobody likes here. That's the free version. Now, the, the small percentage of people can get the group two. That's where you pay co-pays and certain costs but you can go see who you want. And honestly, we have that kind of model here. Uh, the insurance for the military is like that. You have the prime version where, you know, everything's covered, but you have to wait for the appointments, see who they say to see and whatnot. But then you have the other version where you can pay a portion of the cost, which right now is usually 20% of the cost, and you can see who you want, right? So this isn't like a novel idea, but it's something they had to adopt as an option because you know what? If you're told you had to wait three months to see this person before you can get a procedure done, you're kind of stuck when they've already taken all your money in order to prop the system up. Now, see, in the United States, you can be told, hey, you can go to the hospital, hey, you know, we're backed up for a few months. We can't do that. You can go somewhere else, and you weren't taxed double to support it. To be stuck, well, you have to wait here. Instead, you have money, you have margin, you have options, you can go somewhere else. In fact, that's what people do from around the world, to include from nations like this. They come here to the quote-unquote dysfunctional medical uh, system of the United States to get procedures because they can get them here quicker than they can get them back home. So my question really is, which one's the better system? The one people come to or the one that's free, but you got to kind of wait and you get the services they decide you're going to get. What do you really want? This type of system is also known to be slow to introduce new and cutting edge procedures. It lacks innovation. Why? Because it's in a government system. It has to fit within the guidelines, within the regulations. Yeah, you have to, especially in our culture, don't offend this person, this group, that it would just be an ugly, ugly monster have to deal with in, in order to make something happen. No innovation is going to be allowed. You, you're good with what you have. See, one of the, one of the great aspects of uh, the field of medicine in our country is, is we, we spearhead innovation all the time. These other countries don't. They maintain what they have at a high cost, but new things don't really come along. Where does that come from? That comes from us. And even in Denmark, you have regional differences in this healthcare. So you can say it's universal, but even over there, depending on where you live, you're going to get different treatment. <laughs> it's amazing how that happens, right? Not everybody gets the same healthcare. And I want to point out that doctors over there make far less than they make over here. And this is the irony. Even though Denmark is often called one of the best healthcare uh, systems in the world, they don't pay their doctors very well. In fact, guess where is the best place for doctors to work that doctors around the world want to go to and they're the most compensated? Take a wild guess. I'll give you a few seconds. Yep, it's the United States of America. All doctors want to come here because you'll get paid about twice as much as you will in Denmark. See, in Denmark, you make uh, roughly about $119,000 a year, right? It's almost double that to make it here as a doctor in the United States. Oh, but here's the catch. You have a lot less taxes here, and you have more buying power here. So let me put it to you in this perspective. So let's round it up for ease of math, you know, for my benefit, if not yours. Let's say you make $120,000 as a doctor in Denmark. And by the way, specialists don't get any better specialist pay, just, just so you know that, right? But say about half of that's gone in taxes. So your take-home pay, net pay, is about sixty grand a year as a doctor. 
in an overloaded healthcare system. And now with that 60000 you have a higher cost of living and paying for things. Oh, yeah, I'd rather be a doctor over here making double that and having far more take-home pay, and I have better margin in which to buy things with. I have options. I have more options. People want to work for our system more than they want to work in Denmark's. If the main thing to understand is, is Denmark is not us, and we are not Denmark. This is the biggest takeaway we need to have. It's like comparing apples and oranges with these two countries. All right. First off, let me put it just this way. Our population is 57 times the number of Denmark. We have a huge number of people compared to what they have to look after in their system. And our land mass is far much larger, far much larger. Okay. Now you can play this ratio game with, well, if we had more people, we got more money, we got more resources, we could handle it. But no, it, it's different. See, and, and and studies have been done on this. It's a, when things get to a certain size, it begins to break down in efficiency. It simply does, right? Even in Denmark, they break down their healthcare coverage by five different regions in the country, right? Because it's hard to manage at a unified central level. It is. Now imagine multiplying that by 57 in population and a, a huge amount by land mass, which affects how you move supplies, a, a, among other things. Another thing that needs to be considered is the birth and death rate of Denmark versus ours. They have this smaller population, but it's also a stagnant population. Uh, it, it, actually, they have a slight negative in their birth versus death rate. So they're slightly losing more than are being born. So it's it's starting to go on a downward spiral. And, it's, and projections is it's going to get more. They're going to lose more than they gain. Uh, and by comparison, the United States is still growing in its birth rate. I mean, we don't have like the numerous children we used to have. But still, when you look at the comparison, more being born than are dying. And we are growing as a population in the United States. So it's easy to take care of a stagnated population that's not growing versus one that's always growing. It's a different comparison altogether. Oh, and by the way, add to that, we have a vast number of immigrants who come to this country. Adding to that population influx, which is going to constantly grow and put pressure on our social systems. They don't have that problem in Denmark. In fact, they're very hard on immigration. It is hard to immigrate and stay in Denmark. In fact, last year, they, revo they revoked all the residency permits for their Syrian uh, refugees and sent them back. They, they are very hard-nosed on immigration compared to us. I mean, there's even CNN does pieces on them where they point out that, look, they are very hard on their immigration. They do not want outsiders there in that country, whereas in ours, we are constantly receiving people and adding to this nation to include doctors from around the world who want to work here. It's a different dynamic. We are by far a vastly different nation from Denmark to try to compare us to them. If you took what we had and threw it on their system, it would absolutely break them. And that's why they take the measures they do to try to limit populations that they got to take care of. They just couldn't handle it. But when you look at Denmark, it also has different aspects to it, comparing apples to oranges. This is a homogenous people, all right? The United States, we're called a melting pot, and we got people from all over the world. We're descendants from people from all over the world. We constantly have new people coming in, trying to integrate, and, and we have all these different cultures coming together, uh, coexisting, changing, adapting, working together. Uh, and that's what we've been doing for a long time in this country. Denmark, not so much. They have a similar culture, similar ethnicity, similar lifestyles. They're like the same type of people. They all speak the same language. And might I add, they have the same religion. This is another aspect that's kind of ignored in this whole, we should be like Denmark thing. Because you, you have this, they are a homogenous people, mostly white, all unified. 
They have the same mindsets, characteristics, cultures, and lifestyles, but hey, they also have a state-run church. Now, if you was listening to Simon, one of the things he wanted to do was totally eradicate religion from the process whatsoever. They have a state-run church. In fact, 78% of the population belongs to the Church of Denmark. You know what that means? You have a unified faith, a unified denomination even, that is a part of the makeup of these people. And the, in, in Denmark, religious education is mandatory in public school. And by that, I mean the Christian religion is mandatorily taught. It's a mandatory subject matter in their public schools. This is a part of who they are, and they don't hide it. We, by contrast, don't have a state church. We we don't have a unifying religion. Christianity is probably the closest thing, but even then, we are so fragmented. We don't have one church. (laughs) We have all kinds of competing denominations, and, and now, you know, personal bias, some people are calling themselves a church. I wouldn't dare call them a church. They're not even close to a church as far as I'm concerned uh, because they deny basic, simple doctrines of Christianity. But nonetheless, we have all these competing paradigms. It is hard unifying a nation into these block systems to do things when you have so much, can I use the word diversity, to work with. You simply do. These, this is also a healthier people in Denmark. They ride bicycles. They, they eat better meals. You know, in the United States, we, we commute hours to work a day, setting still at, at workplaces, and, and then we eat fast food all the time. We're, we're more obese, right? So we have, health, we have health issues by our lifestyle, whereas their lifestyle is a little bit more healthier, right? That tends to have less strain on the health system. See, there's a lot of things you got to compare. You can't just say, we should be like them. Well, okay, ride a bike to work every day. Good luck with that jump. Go ahead and take your hour commute on a bicycle and cycle on down there, right? But all that considered, also consider this before you do the whole, the grass is greener over there thing, right? There are people in Denmark who want to be more like us. And they point to things like, we have... This, uh, this concept that we have the freedom to fail. We can try, fail, try again, fail, try again, fail, in hopes that we might succeed. That don't exist as much there, all right? They, they envy our entrepreneurship and the building of new things. See, new things, systems stay stagnant. We allow entrepreneurship and change. We have advantages in venture capital that they envy and they would like. And here's a big thing. They look at our social mobility as something to envy. Social mobility. Rising up from where you're at. And part of the reason is, is because the leftist paradigms are pretty much, they want everybody to be the same. You, you, they want you to have the same. They, they don't want someone looking like they're getting ahead of somebody else. Because then they're like, People fall into that safety net, but they put everybody in the safety net to make them the same. It's crazy. I don't know. I don't know if they've wrestled with this yet, but the idea of social mobility is that you can rise up as well. That if you fall, you can still get back up and rise. That's how, again, the right usually views the safety net. You get caught, get up, move. Look, I have fallen into these nets. I'm not against them. Many have. Look, I've, I've done the food stamps and the WIC, and I've used the unemployment office and, not, you know, and none of it worked really well. <laughs> I think WIC was the best thing. It was more uh, predictable, I think. But uh, nonetheless, I've used these things. But then I'd get out on my feet and I'd move on. We don't do that here. We keep filling it up because it's a source of political power. Even CNN writes articles that Denmark is becoming more like us. Look it up. They have to change what they got going on or the system they have is simply going to become bloated and break on them. Now, we're two different nations, different populations in size and in makeup and just who we are. We're different nations in, well, economic capability. We're different nations in how much we're willing to tax ourselves in order to get something. 
If you consider this an investment, is that really what you want to get? That, that's all I want to ask you. Some of you, you're like, no matter what, I want, I want universal health care, and I don't care what it costs. Well, all right, have at it, but I'm telling you that that's what is going to be the cost for you. The rich are not going to pay for it. Corporations are not going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it, and it won't be free. You're calling it free. It won't be free. And it's an investment, but you're going to have months of waiting time. You're going to have a lack of innovation. You're going to get treatments, as they say, you're allowed to get unless you pay out of pocket. But guess what? You've already been paying for the health care that you're staying in line for. To me, that doesn't advocate anything about liberty at all. And it's not a real good return on our investment. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you loved today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.